Why are you being so polite to me tonight? Robert, please, please come. Here's what you need to know about Robert. Robert has been through the flood. He's been through the fire. He's qualified to be here. He's qualified by God, by God because he's a man of integrity. Now, he's done a bunch of stuff, but that's not what we're about here tonight. He's here tonight because he's on a mission, because he's qualified by God. He's been a pastor. He's been an evangelist. But, but that was the training ground. There are many pastors that go on and have, because they survive, and they go on. <laughs> they go on, and, and God, in that equipment, God gives them a greater boundary, and that's what's happened to Robert. Robert now lives in Texas, but in his obedience to God, he didn't always live in Texas. He, always, he just went wherever God told him to go. He's been in Colorado. Now he's back in Texas. He's had to recover from unbelievable things that if I told you, it would all, you'd all be offended at the, at the unusual amounts of things that if he's had to do. Yes. But let me just tell you what. They are the scars of an apostle. And that is what you're going to, and that's who you're going to be listening to tonight. An apostolic gift with a prophetic sense of the timing of God. It's almost like he's an Issachar prophet. But he's going to be giving us directives tonight that will lay an apostolic foundation for, for the future. God is building an apostolic and prophetic company, and he is using men and women like Robert to lay the proper foundation to expand your concept of how the kingdom of God works. And we thank God for Robert. Now, Robert has a wife that nobody ever sees. <laughs> well, that, that, we, that we did see her in Oklahoma, and, and we know that she is a very special part of him, even though he is, is here without her. He has, how many children do you have? Six, and he's there, he's still raising some of them. Uh -huh. And that means if he is qualified to speak as to the power of prayer and the power of the word of God to bring children along and to bring them up out and set them on the proper course. And that is what you have lost in land. And we love you. And we were so excited that this could this opportunity could come. And so we welcome you to Kansas and, and you can come back anytime. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. I think I think we this is actually the just him being here was a miracle because his schedule was clipped up all the way through 2016. And when Sandy and Dean uh, introduced us to him, he said, you know, my schedule was booked up all the way through 2016. But I just had a cancellation in Peru. What's Brazil. Brazil. Got a cancellation in Brazil. We said, well, that must be God. Amen. So this is a miracle that he's here. And one more quick thing before he starts. If you have a cell phone, please let's just be respectful and turn them all on to vibrate mode or turn them off, please. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. You'll be blessed. Amen. Thank you, guys. It's good to be in Kansas. And, yeah. and I appreciate so much Sandy and Deanne and the whole leadership in Kansas. Uh, it's, a, it's a great honor to get to be with them. I met them running around with Dutch, probably, I guess, was the first time. Dutch Sheets. Uh, Dutch and I, uh, we have a love-hate relationship. I love him, he hates me. Uh, <laughs> whenever he's here, he actually says the exact opposite. Uh, but uh, anyway, it's, it's, a, it's great to get to be here with you guys and uh, get to be a part of what God's doing here in Kansas and excited about what God's doing in Kansas. You know, how many of you, how many of you know that we are in the midst of an awakening. Yeah. Yeah. It's already started, yeah. as has already been said. I, I'm amazed when I watch TV. You say TV, yeah. Uh, do you realize that, how many of you watch The Voice? Yeah. Anybody watch The Voice? Which is a national show on NBC. And a few weeks back, a young man got up from Lee College 
and sang Great Is Your Faithfulness, and it was the greatest selling iTunes recording, but I don't understand how it all works, for that week. Wow. Just amazing. Because he sang a song about God's faithfulness. A, a couple of seasons ago, a young man won the competition because he sang the old rugged cross. And last night, I was watching TV, and Dolly Parton had a show on, uh, on, on the coat of many colors, and they basically preached the gospel in that show. The people have to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, and they're not going to heaven. And they, I looked at my wife, I said, I cannot believe they left this on TV. I, I was absolutely astounded because there was no compromise or... Or, or, or watering it down. It was her story of what happened to her regarding that song that she recorded and all those kind of things. So, I mean, you know, when you start seeing things like that happen in culture, yeah. there's something shifting. Yeah. There's something moving. See, we don't need to be down in the mouth and think, well, everything's getting worse and worse. No, 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 no. We are in the midst of the revival already that has begun. Yes. And we need to be a part of watering it and keeping it going and letting it turn into the reformation that God said he wants it to be. Amen? Yes. So I'm really excited about what God's doing in our nation and in the nations of the world. Yes. And it, it is really a great place. I was supposed to have been in Brazil. I'm actually glad to be here. <laughs> I've traveled so many to so many different countries this 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 year. I've, I've traveled for 250 days this year, and out of what 365 is that how many's in the year? And and so it's really good to get to be this close to home. And you know, when I get through on Sunday, to be able to go back home rather than be you know thousands of miles away in some foreign country somewhere. So whenever that one canceled, I was like, ah, oh, well, that's not too bad. And then, and then, I mean, immediately these guys came and said, hey, can you come to Kansas? I said, absolutely. <laughs> Kansas, Brazil, I'll take Kansas. <laughs> so, so it's really great to be here. Okay, some of you, you've listened to me on DVD, CD, whatever you've heard. Um, you'll probably hear me say some of the similar things, but, but I'm just going to kind of move in what I feel like God's saying for us today. But before I do that, I want to tell you a story. Uh, Deanne said that I'm married to Mary. She's, we've been married for 38 years. We're high school sweethearts. Uh, married right out of high school. Graduated in May, married in August in 1977. Uh, we made it. We've got, I mean, see, you can't, you can't stop now. We've got too much, too much history together, so you just keep going. Um, <laughs> so, so, but in the middle of it, we have six children. The oldest is 35, the youngest is 23. Uh, and I say they're all of legal age. They didn't say they were grown. I said they're all of legal age. Uh, but um, uh, but when Hope, which was our, let me see, was that Adam, Sarah? Uh, no, no, Ryan, Sarah, Adam. Hope, fourth one, fourth one. Uh, she has red hair. And whenever she was like four, four or five years old, we had finally got the other three in school. So Mary was at home with Hope by herself. Little did we know that we had another one coming named Micah, but anyway, we didn't know this at this time. So Mary's at home with Hope, glad that, that all the other kids are in school. Any moms, you'll know what I'm talking about, where the kids are all got to school, you got a few hours at home by yourself. So she's glad for this, and so Mary's walking into the house doing, doing housework. And Hope is laying on the floor, five years old, right before she goes to school, and she's laying, laying on the floor with her hands behind her head, looking up at the TV, sitting on a bench that has a heart cut into it. Some of you may have seen those benches. Okay, so she's got her feet in that heart. And Hope's got a little, a little five-year-old feet in this heart, and she's watching The Price is Right. It's 10 o'clock in the morning. Mary's going through with something in her hands, and she hears Hope say, Ew, she's ugly. So Mary stops. So what are you talking about, Hope? She said, this woman on The Price is Right, she's ugly. And Mary said, why is she ugly? He said, because she's got red hair. <laughs> Mary Hope has had red hair. And, and Mary said, well, Hope, you have red hair. And Hope said, I know, but it looks good on me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, no, Hope really fully appreciated that. She always said she was a party waiting to happen. <laughs> That's Hope. But, but, but watch this. How many you know Hope had a good identity, a good self-worth? Yeah. She knew who she was. She was happy with who she was. 
She was satisfied with who she was. How many of you know, if we don't come to the place where we are happy and satisfied with who we are and what we are and know who we are and what we are, the enemy is going to exploit that and use that against us. And whenever you step into the courts of heaven, I am finding this more and more. You have to know who you are. Because, see, one of the greatest things the enemy will do is he will try to use intimidation to work against you. Now, before I ever understood anything about the courts of heaven, I remember we were on a 21-day fast. Because I had called a 21-day fast. I'm leading the church in Waco, Texas. Anybody ever heard of Waco? Okay. Somebody says, you were in Waco. Yeah, I, led an, I raised up and led an apostolic center for 15 years in Waco. Then I handed, off, handed it off and left. People say, why did you leave Waco? I said, they burnt my compound down and I had to leave. <laughs> now, some of you are looking at each other. No, 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 I'm just joking. But, but we were there when all that happened. And so, so we were on a 21-day fast, you know, deep in, I've probably been there 10, 12 years by now. And because someone had told me that, that, you know, fasting, you know, if you did this right, it would help break some things and you could move. And so, I, you know, my attitude was, you know, if, if that works, well, I mean, I fasted before, but if that works, then let's just go after this thing of the first year with all of our being. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going after, we're going after, I've got the whole staff. Pretty large staff on a full-time, full-fledged fast. Everybody else in the church is doing what they can and keep their work schedules. We're meeting morning, noon, and night to to pray. And uh, and you know they told me they said no. You know if you'll fast at least 21 days after about the third or fourth day, you won't be hungry anymore. <laughs> well, I'm here to tell you they lied. <laughs> I don't know who told them that or if they came up with it themselves, but they lied. Because let me tell you how long I was hungry. 21 days. 21 days how long I was hungry. Yeah, I'm not joking. I was hungry for 21 days. And so, so anyway, we're in the middle of this fast. Probably about 14 days into it. And this lady calls the church. It's a member of the church. You go, we got several hundred there. And she says, hey, I'm, I've just been to the doctor. I've been diagnosed with lupus. It's really bad. So, could I come and you pray for me? We had a lot of healings going on at that time. And I said... You know, yeah, I said, why don't you come at the lunchtime when we're all praying anyway? And we'll just pray for you there. So she said, okay. So we went through the day and we went to lunch. And, you know, by 14, 15 days into this fast, I mean, whenever you get through a prayer meeting, all you want to do is go lay down somewhere. <laughs> and so I'm getting through and I, I, I'm thinking, okay, we got this one done and I'm going to go lay down. And about the time I get finished, everybody's leaving to go back to work. Here comes this lady in. She's coming in uh, to get prayed for her because I'd forgotten it. And everybody's leaving, and I'm there, and I think my son Adam is there. So she comes in, and she comes up front, and she and her name is Jennifer. And I said, hi, Jennifer. She said, yeah. She said, I'm so glad. Thank you for praying for me. And I said, well, yeah, that's fine. So I'm standing on the platform, which is about that high probably. And she comes, and she stands like facing this way. And I'm standing this way. And I lay my hand on her, and I'm tired. I'm weak. I mean, I've been fasting for 14, 15 days. Remember, I'm hungry. The last thing I really want to do is pray for her. What I really want to do is go eat. But I got my hand on her head, and I just said, Lord, I just ask for you to heal Jennifer. I mean, it's a very weak prayer. And I hear the Lord whisper. I hear him say, rebuke the devil. Satan, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. I mean, that's about what I did. Her feet came up off the floor, went straight up in the air, and she landed on, on her shoulders, bam, her eyes rolled back in her head, and this demonic voice came out of this little, probably 95 pound, literally, seriously, 95 pound woman, and this is what it said when it, when it hit the floor, and I knew immediately what that, I dealt with it before, I dealt on the floor immediately, and her husband, who came with her, is like this. <laughs> I've been sleeping with that. <laughs> and this voice, this guttural voice, comes out of this little girl. And this is what it says to me. I judge you. It says this to me. It says, to me, I judge you. That's what the thing says to me. Well, see... When those things do this to me, I become angry. <laughs> and I said, this is what 
I said now. You judge me. I judge you by the blood of Jesus. It shut up immediately. Now, I just, we got it cast out. She got healed. Completely delivered. Completely freed. But watch this. My reason for telling you that is that the thing by saying it was judging me, I look back now and realize it was saying, I have a case against you. I have a right not to have to obey what you're telling me to do. I judge you because I want to say this. Everything, when you run up, everything is legal in the spirit realm. Everything. See, this is why that the cross is the greatest legal transaction of history. It's a legal, it was a legal transaction. That's why Jesus said, it is finished. What did he mean by that? He meant every legal mandate that is required for God to reclaim the universe back to himself has now been met. It's finished. Amen. So Jesus understood when he died on the cross, he was completing a legal transaction that was necessary for God to claim everything back to himself. See, but why? Because everything is legal in the spirit realm. I am convinced of this. And when I understood this, it helped me begin to process things on an entirely different basis. That's why Peter Wagner in the book that I wrote, he said, this is a game changer. Because we have thought of, of the conflict being on the battlefield when Robert is actually saying the conflict is in a courtroom. I mean, no, both are conflicts. But we have to know how to take away the legal right of the enemy because until we take away the legal right of the enemy to operate, he doesn't have to do anything we tell him to do. Now, help, let, me, let me help you understand this. I'm just going to walk through this. Just Let me show you scriptures. I, um, Revelation 19 and verse 11. Let me just walk through this for a few moments with you. We'll just kind of lay a foundation tonight and see where we go. <clears throat> but Revelation 19 verse 11. It says, Now I saw heaven open, John said, And behold, a white horse... And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, watch what it says, he judges and makes war. Judgment is judicial activity. Making war is battlefield. This is what I felt the Lord said to me. Notice the order. You never, ever go to war until you first been to the court. That you have to know how to get judgments in place, get judicial things in place, before you can step onto the battlefield and win. Are you getting that? This is an order. He judges and he makes war. Now, the best way I know how to explain this is, is from the, what, you, what the Bible says that we are kings and priests to our God. Okay, Revelation chapter 1 I think it's verse 6. Let me, let me just, well, since we're here, let's just turn and read this so we'll all have a point of reference. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 6. It has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to whom be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. See, we, that we have been made kings and priests by virtue of what Jesus has done. And in Revelation chapter 5, I believe it's about verse 12. Um, he, uh, excuse me, it's about verse uh, 10. Revelation 5, verse 10, and has made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. So, so we, and in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, says that we're a royal priesthood. Royalty speaking of kingship, priesthood obviously speaking of that function. See, the best way to explain going to court and then to the battlefield is from this perspective. Okay, let me explain to you about this by, by, by showing this. The job of priest is to get legal things in place. That's the job of priest. Stop and think about when God instituted the priesthood back in the days of Aaron. Whenever he said Aaron would be the high priest and then his sons would be priests with him and all this, what would they do? They would take the off 
offerings of the people. They would offer the offerings in behalf of the people. Remember? And based on the offerings, hear what I'm about to say, it would grant God the legal right to be able to hear his people's prayers and respond to them. Now, you really see this in, in, in the Day of Atonement. When they would take the blood of the Passover lamb, and they would go behind the veil, the priest would go behind the veil, and they would pour out and sprinkle the blood. Watch this. On the basis of the testimony of that blood, it granted God the legal right to roll the sins of Israel back off of them for one more year. Because you got to get this. Forgiveness is never free. Forgiveness is a result, watch what I'm about to say, of Jesus giving God the legal right by his blood to forgive us. You say, well, God's God. He can just decide to forgive. No. God has to have a legal right to forgive. The priest, when he offered the blood of the bulls and goats, he would give God the legal right to forgive their sins or to roll their sins off of them for one year. It was the testimony of the blood that gave him that legal right. Are you getting this? Amen. That's why God forgives us for Jesus' sake. Remember those kind of verses in Ephesians? God forgives us for Jesus' sake. What does that mean? He, he, Jesus' sacrifice gives God the legal right to be merciful. Because what, what's what I'm about to say? God is always looking for the legal right to be merciful. Amen. Now, I just said something very significant there. God is always, see, we've got to understand this about his nature. In fact, I'm going to just make a statement. If God was to judge America, it would be because the ecclesia failed to give him the legal right to be merciful. Anytime God judges a nation, it's because the ecclesia in that nation failed to give God the legal right to be merciful. You say, what are you talking about? Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah? God says, the cry has come up before me. I have to destroy it. But then he says, can I do this thing without telling my friend Abraham? So you casually read that and you think, oh, God's just going to tell Abraham so that you know Abraham will know because he's, he's God's friend. No, God told Abraham for a strategic reason. The reason God told Abraham what he was going to do to Sodom and Gomorrah is because God knew Abraham as his friend knew his heart. And that God, by telling Abraham, wasn't telling Abraham so he can prophesy and get his picture on charisma. Or get on TBN. Or go on Sid Roth. Which I'm going to be on, by the way. Or... We already texted all that. Or any of that. That wasn't the reason he got... Abraham understood because he was God's friend. God told me this because he wants me to seek to give him a legal reason to be merciful. Which is exactly what Abraham did. He said, will you spare it for 50? I'll spare it for 50 righteous. All the way down to 10. Guys, please get this. God said, if there's ten righteous, that will be sufficient for me, watch this, to spare a whole population. And people have said all my lifetime, Abraham stopped too soon, he should have went to one. But they don't understand, ten was the smallest number that constituted a government within that culture. And even within the culture of God. God was saying, ten, even though it's the smallest number, will give me the legal right as a government I can recognize that will give me the legal right to be merciful and not have to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Guess what? The church is God's government. God says, if my church can come before me as judge, which is what Abraham did. He said, will not the judge of all the earth do right? If my church can come before me as judge and give me the legal right, it can give me what I'm looking for 
to spare a nation rather than have to judge a nation. You say, oh, we need all of America to repent. No, we don't. We need the pornographers to repent. No, we don't. We need the murderers to repent. No, we don't. You say, well, we need the government to repent. Not the federal government. The church. Then if the church can repent, if my people who are called by name, my name, will seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven. I will heal their land. He said, I don't need everybody to repent. I need my church to take its position in the courts of heaven and repent for themselves and the sins of their nation. And that will be sufficient to grant me the legal right to be merciful to a nation. Are you getting this? See, this is what Ezekiel 22.30 says. God said, I sought for a man, one man, to stand in the gap. So that I could be merciful, but I couldn't find him. Therefore, I had to pour my indignation out. As Ezekiel, I don't know what I said, but Ezekiel 22, 30 and 31. See, God says, I'm just looking for somebody to take their position. One man. Now, I believe that's the carpet man that, that God's putting together. But you need to also know this. Did you know one priest, one man, went behind the veil one time a year. One, one man. And his activity behind that veil in the courts of heaven, because that's where that, that's what was behind the veil. His activity behind that veil in the secret place that nobody else was seeing gave God the legal right to bless a nation rather than have to judge them. This has always been God's pattern. So the first thing we need to realize God's looking for the legal right to be merciful. He's always looking for the legal right. Jesus said, if you understood this saying, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. You would not have condemned those I'm not condemning. We can get so self-righteous. God said, look, see, see, watch. This is why it's so important for the church to release the right testimony in the courts of heaven. See, we don't understand when we, when we come before God that our testimony we release has everything to do with whether we're giving him the legal right to bless or to judge. <coughs> you say, how, how do you get that? The ten spies came back. Two of the guys of the, of the twelve, Joshua and Caleb, gave a good, good report. They said, look, let's go take the land. We're ready to go. They're, they're, they're our food. But ten of them said, but there's giants there. There's walled city. There's, there's chariots of iron. We can't take it. And God's brought us out here, and now our children are going to die. And we and our children are going to die. Remember that? When God heard that report, here's what he said. On the basis of your report, your testimony, that you are releasing... I render a verdict against you. For every day you are in the promised land of spies, this nation will wander in the wilderness for a year. So ten spies, watch this, caused a nation to wander for 40 years because they gave the wrong testimony in the courts of heaven that heaven heard. That's why the church better be careful what is prophesying in these times. We better not be prophesying judgment over America. We better be prophesying mercy and grace and what is written in the books of heaven over America and declaring his passion that God still has for America. I'm serious about that. Because based on the testimony we release... We are either giving God the legal right to bless or the legal right to judge. Because judges make decisions based on testimony released to them. If the court of heaven is a real court, that's the basis on which decisions are made. It's made based 
on the testimony released. And we're the ones that are giving testimony in the courts of heaven. Amen? Amen. So God's looking for a legal reason to be merciful. That's our job as the ecclesia to give it to him. That's why I say one more time, if God judges a, a nation, it's because the ecclesia of that nation failed to give him the legal right to be merciful. That's our job. Lord, we, we don't want America judged. We don't want death and murder and decay and destruction and, and all of that, Lord. We don't want to see hundreds of thousands and millions go in to a Christless eternity. We don't want to see that. We want to see salvation. We want to see mercy. We want to see goodness. We want to see kindness. That's our job as the ecclesia. Amen? Amen. So, again, one of the best ways to understand that we get judicial decisions first before we go to the battlefield is to understand the job that we have as priests, individually and corporately. Our job as priests is to give God the legal right. Now let me explain this. We're obviously not taking the blood of bulls and goats anymore. We're taking the blood of Jesus. We take the blood of Jesus and we repent for our sins and the sins of our fathers. And we ask for the blood of Jesus to be sufficient, which it is, to forgive us of our sins and to forgive, watch this, the sins of the fathers so that the legal right the enemy is using to bring destruction, or if you can hear this, I'll get to this probably tomorrow, to land curses is taken out of the way. Because, let me just, I'll just say this to you. Curses, according to Proverbs 26, can only land where there's a cause. When it says a cause, that means it's found the legal right. And I'm going to tell you that most curses are the result of the iniquity that's in the bloodline. Or the iniquity that's in the history of a culture or a people. And if we're going to take away the curse that's operating against a family or a nation... We're going to have to deal with the iniquity by repenting not just for our sins, but the sins in our history. You say, where do you get that? This is why they repented for the sins of themselves and of their fathers. Nehemiah did it. Hezekiah did it. All, all of Daniel did it. That they would repent for their sins and the sins of their fathers because they understood the reason we're in captivity is because of the sins of our fathers that has given the devil the legal right to bring us into captivity. And so if we're going to get out of captivity and back into what God has for us, and God's going to turn the captivity of Zion, I'm going to have to deal not just with my sin, but the sin of my father as well. My father's. Now you see, you say, well, wait a minute, I don't understand that. Okay, 2 Samuel 23. It's a really good picture of this. 2 Samuel 23, the scripture says that there was a famine in the land for three years. And David doesn't know why. I mean, the first year, just a bad year. Second year, maybe a coincidence. Third year, it's getting really serious now. Serious. we got to get this thing dealt with. Our lives are going to be pretty much pretty soon be at stake. Because there's no rain, the crops aren't growing, we got a problem. So after three years, God, David asked God, why is this happening? And God says to him, because Saul, your predecessor, 70 years ago, 70 decades ago, or seven decades ago, he broke covenant with the Gibeonites that Joshua had sworn to protect even though they deceived him. 
And the reason there's a famine in the land today is because of the broken covenant that Saul did with the Gibeonites. And if you want to get rain back in the country and, and get that land healed and get crops coming again and get prosperity moving again, you're going to have to deal with this broken covenant that happened 70 years ago that you had nothing to do with but your predecessor was guilty of. Remember that story? So David goes to the Gibeonites. What do I need to do? He says, give me the sons of Saul. Seven of them, I believe. We'll kill them. We'll hang them in the sun. Whenever that's done, as far as we're concerned, that's enough to leave. Listen, there's a picture. Watch this. There's a death required to deal with the sin of the past. We don't have to kill people today. That's good and bad. Because one's already died. His name is Jesus. See, we take the, his blood and his body that was offered in his death. And we repent and we ask for that to be sufficient to deal with the sin of our history that's allowing the enemy a legal right now to bring a curse that's causing famine to be in the land for three years as it was in David's day. And the Bible says that when David dealt with this, and this is a powerful statement, it says, and God heeded the prayer of the land. That literally prayers that had not been getting any results, the same prayers, now got results because he had dealt with the legal right of the enemy, not just because of his sin, but the sin of the fathers that was allowing him the legal right to land present day curses against us, against David. Are you getting that? So I have discovered that most curses have their roots in the sins of ancestors. Or what the Bible calls iniquity. You see, iniquity is the sin in the bloodline. You following me? Okay, can I just go a little further with that? Iniquity is a very devious thing. First of all, because many times we don't know what it is. We're like, if I knew what it was, I would repent of it. Let me give you, let me, let me just use this. How many of you have ever experienced delay? The body of Christ is full of delay. But we're sick of it. We are tired of it. We were supposed to have been in our destiny a long time ago. Now watch what I'm about to say. A friend of mine, Ken Malone, is in Florida, had a dream. This, this, this really exemplifies. He had a dream. In the dream, and he doesn't really know about the courts of heaven. I think since he ordered my book, my daughter said. But, but he had a dream, and in the dream he saw all these pregnant people, both men and women. Yeah, obviously it's a spiritual dream. <laughs> Women pregnant, men pregnant. Some are pregnant a few months. Some are pregnant for nine months. Some are pregnant for ten months. Some are pregnant for twelve months. Some are pregnant for two years. Some are pregnant for decades. Now, my wife has had six children. I've watched them. I've watched her have six children. She asked me when my daughter had her babies, do you want to come in here? I said, no, thank you. <laughs> six times is enough. I definitely do not want to see my daughters in that situation. So I'll stand here and pray. But I watched my wife have these kids. And I'm telling you, whenever she was start getting the, the nine-month period, we're trying to figure out any way we can to get this thing out of her. <laughs> you know, my mom was saying, take castor oil. <laughs> I think Mary took some castor oil. I mean, I think, how does this work? Does it like, make it slippery so it slides out? I don't know why this works. <laughs> but I mean, 
mean, I'm watching Mary, and I'm watching her, you know, get in chairs. And then I'm watching her get out of chairs. She's miserable. I mean, miserable at the nine month period. I can't imagine being pregnant for decades and overdue for that long. Because in, in Ken's dream, nine months was like the birthing time. But yet, all these people, and watch this, he said, in the dream, the reason they were all overdue and unable to give birth at the appropriate time. Well, because this is what he said in the dream. He saw the accuser of the brethren have a case against them that was stopping them from having the legal right to bring forth what they were carrying. When he told that dream, I was like, wow. You see, the word accuser in Revelation 12.10 is the Greek word kategoros. K-A-T-A-G-O-R-O-S, Kategoros, and it means a complainant at law. It means one who is bringing a complaint against you in a legal system. So Ken was saying, the reason we are delayed, the reason we are not bringing forth in the appropriate time, the reason we are miserable and frustrated and carrying something from God that we can't get out of us is because the accuser has a case against us. How many of you have ever felt that way? I have. I cannot tell you how many things have been promised me. Seriously, good intention people promised me all sorts of things. I finally stopped believing any of them. Because I knew it was only going to be one more disappointment. I told you I was, we filmed the program for Sid Roth. A few weeks back, so be on, I think it's going to be on the first part of January. Because he wanted me to come talk about the courts of heaven. What you don't know is that they contacted us over two years ago. We want you to come on the program. We want you to talk about the courts of heaven. We've read your book. We like your book. So we went through the whole, I mean, long questionnaires, filling out all the stuff. They said, after it was all said, you're in the queue. <laughs> you're in the line. We will be contacting you on when we want you to come film. Awesome. It's happening. A month passes, no word. Two month passes, no word. Three month passes, no word. I'm thinking, well, I don't want to be a nuisance. After about the fourth or fifth month, I tell my daughter, would you send them an email and see what's going on? She sends them an email, no response. Six, seven, eight months passes, no response. Finally, about the year mark, I said to my daughter, just forget it. I don't want to do it anymore. I'm heading up to here. I'm sick of it. This always happens. Because it always did happen. Over and over and over and over and over again. In this situation and others. Over and over. Delay, 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 delay. I'm sick of it. Just forget it. <laughs> About after, right after that, I would say within a week or two, I have a dream. In the dream, <coughs> my great grandfather oh, has committed a sin of negligence that has caused someone else to be damaged, that has caused a judgment to be against me now. 
That was the whole dream. That my great grandfather, that I never knew. I barely remember my grandfather. But my great grandfather, that I never knew, had done something in negligence that had hurt someone else that was now causing a judgment from a present day court in my dream to be against me. Well, it doesn't take a rocket science to figure this out when you understand the courts of heaven. I get up and I understand my great-grandfather was negligent. I don't know how or in what area. I don't know who he hurt. But I went to prayer that morning, and for an hour I repented and asked for the blood of Jesus to forgive me and my lineage for every place of negligence and to forgive my great-grandfather and let the blood answer this accusation that is against me that is causing the promises of God unable to be a reality because of something that happened in my generations many years before. I repented in weeping and tears. Within days, Sid Roth calls me. His people call me. I'm in California. Within days. My daughter, first of all, called me and said, Sid Roth called. His people called. I said, oh, really? Okay. Do you want to talk to him? Yeah, I want to talk to him. So the lady calls. Her name is Donna. Donna says, Mr. Anderson, we've been trying to get in touch with you. Really? <laughs> yes, we would love for you to be on our show. <laughs> really? Yes. Uh, I've already done this once, and I was told I'm in the queue. And she says, well, she says, we have no record of that. Oh, <laughs> It was a man we talked to. We don't know who that would be. We have no record of this. But we talked to somebody. She could tell I'm upset. And she says, thank God she's so nice. She said, well, do you still want to be on the show? And I suddenly realized, I need to be nice. <laughs> and I said, yes, ma'am, I'm sorry. I am sorry for being irritated. It's just, you know, we walk through this. And she said, I understand. She was so nice. I understand. And we started the process. And I mean, within a few weeks, things were scheduled and we were there and it was done. All because I took away the legal right of the enemy to cause delay. You see, that delay we've been experiencing, that pregnancy that is perpetual that we can't get rid of this thing, it could be because there's something legal against us. And we need to repent for ourselves and our generations and take away the legal right of the enemy to use that against us. Are you getting, are you understanding this? God wants, God wants to end the delay. By the way, we are having a conference in February in Dallas area. February 25, 26, is what it's called No More Delay Unlocking Destiny from the Courts of Heaven. I would suggest if you want to understand this more, that you come to that conference. I got people from South Africa and Germany coming that understand the courts. They have me come teach on the courts because I find out they know a whole lot more sometimes than I do. So I'm going to the experience to bring them over, all this kind of thing, and we're going to try to, we're going to, we're going to move into the courts and see the legal rights of the enemy to cause delay to be ended. Let me just tell you what happened. I lined up this, I'm doing this by faith, stepping into faith, believing this is something we need to do. <coughs> the expense associated with every, and everything. Immediately after I get it booked, I get a phone call when I'm in Alaska from a, a guy that I haven't heard from in years. He's real prophetic. And he says, I had a dream about you last night. I said, you did? He said, yeah. And I'm, hope, I'm thinking, as I step out, I hope it's about this conference. He says, 
You were in this big auditorium. There's people there. And you were training them. He said, you had on training gear, like Rocky. He said, he said, your wife, Mary, was standing next to you. I'm thinking, they would really get to see she exists. <laughs> she was standing next to you. He said, you're he said, so you're going through this training. He said, you, you, you end the session. People are all excited. She said, and you look at this lady, which I have some ladies coming. that's going to be doing some of the teaching. He said, you look at this lady. And you say to her, now, next session... She said, he said, I said to her, I want you to teach on tampons. <laughs> and he said, and when he said, I thought, just like some of you, what? <laughs> and he said, the Lord spoke to me. He said, tampons are what are used to end one cycle and begin a new one. And he said, I don't know what, he said, no. he said, I don't know what you're doing, but he said, this is going to be used by God to end the old cycle and start the new one. And here's what I said, finally, finally, we're going to get out of the old and get into the new. Finally, we're going to stop the delay, unlock the, the, the destiny from the courts of heaven, and we're going to move into this thing with everything that God has, has for us. And then you're ready to do that. Then we need to know how to function as priests. Take the blood of Jesus. Deal with those issues. Okay. Now I need to finish this. But we're not just priests. We're also kings. The job of priest is to intercede to grant God the legal right that he needs to be merciful. The job of kings is to decree until it becomes a reality. That's what you see. Kings and priests are two different functions. Priests get legal things in place. Kings make decrees and they put the legal verdicts that's been rendered into place until it becomes a reality. That's why Jesus went forth to judge and then to make war. Judgment is the job of priests. Get legal things in place. Making war is what kings do. But we do that through our decrees. Through, through decreeing into place the verdicts that have been rendered. Are you following me? See, people ask me, say, well, I feel like we've got some things moved in the spirit realm on the legal end. What do I do now? I said, you decree that thing until it becomes reality. Because that's what that's when we're moving from, from, from priesthood into kingship. Are you following me? Okay, let me give you a really, really, to me, one of the best pictures of it. And we'll close with this. Because I have whole messages on decreeing and maybe we'll go into some of that. But... But let me just put it to you this way. When Jesus comes to the tomb of Lazarus, some of you may have heard me say this. He gets there and he says, with all these people gathered around, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. John 11, verse 41. And I know that you always hear me. But for the sake of those that are all standing here, I'm saying this so they'll know that you heard me. So clearly on the way to the tomb, Jesus has been praying. Would you say that's pretty clear? He's been in prayer. What's he been doing? This is my opinion. He's been functioning in priesthood. He hasn't been begging God to raise Lazarus. That's not prayer. He's been dealing with every legal thing that allowed the enemy to put Lazarus in the tomb prematurely. Because if the enemy found a legal right to kill Lazarus, which he clearly did, then Jesus needs to deal with that legal right that Satan has found. You say, well, where are you getting this? 1 Peter 5, 8. Your adversary, the devil, goes about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. The word adversary is the Greek word antidikos. It means one who brings a lawsuit. That's what the word means. 
your adversary, your antidecos, the one who is bringing a lawsuit, the devil, is seeking a legal right to devour you. Satan cannot devour without a legal right. Things don't just happen. They happen because he found a legal right. If, listen, if he could devour at will, we'd all be dead. He can't. He has to have a legal right. And he finds the legal right through our sins, through our activities, but the sins of our bloodline. So Lazarus is dead in the tomb because the enemy found a legal right to kill him and put him there. So Jesus is having to function in his priesthood and deal with the legal things as he prays that allowed Satan to put Lazarus in that tomb prematurely because it clearly was not Lazarus' time to die. Do you know how many people have died prematurely? So you've got to understand this about antidecos, one who brings a lawsuit. It comes from two words, anti and decos. Anti means against. Decos means rights. It literally means that the purpose of a lawsuit is to deny you what's rightfully yours. <laughs> this is why we pray prayers that don't get answered. This is why people die prematurely that aren't supposed to. This is why financial breakthrough doesn't come even though we've done everything we know to do. And we say, well, it didn't work for me because there's a case against you you haven't discovered yet that you need for God to unveil so that you can take the legal right of the anti decos away so that he has no power to resist God's will from being done in your life and cause delay that actually brings destruction. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? So, Jesus comes to the tomb of Lazarus. He's been praying. He's been revoking and dealing with the legal issues, maybe in Lazarus' life, maybe in his bloodline, I don't know that allowed the enemy to kill Lazarus prematurely. He's got it done. So he says, Lord, I pray. You know I pray. We've been in conversation. And I'm saying this not because I need for you to know it. I'm saying this so these here will know it because of what I'm about to do. Because I'm about to step out of priesthood and into kingship. Because guess what? When he comes to the tomb of Lazarus, and finally gets him to roll the stone away, he doesn't pray anymore. He doesn't. He doesn't function as a priest anymore. He steps out of priesthood in the kingship, and he simply says, Lazarus, come forth! And it says the dead man, resurrection life and power, went into that tomb and caused that dead man to be raised again, and he came out tomb completely whole and well they had to take the, the, the grave clothes off him but he was completely healed completely restored completely redeemed because Jesus knew how to function both in priesthood and kingship yes. and his decree had power because of his work that he had done in priesthood see people ask me this all the time well I tried I tried what you said and it didn't work for me. Now listen, we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. My daughter says we get 100 to 200 emails a day. That's a lot of emails from all over the world on this. 100 to 200 a day. Some are prayer requests, which I can't, we can't do anything with. They want me to call and lead them through the courts. Some or testimonies, and some are asking questions, but there's 100 to 200 a day. And some of them are great faith builders. Others are, I did it. I know it's true. I understand. I see it. But why did it? 
Because maybe sometimes we haven't done the work in our priesthood that we need to do before we step into kingship. I'm going to close with this. A young man named Justin up in Winnipeg, Canada. Let me see if I can find his testimony right quick. I keep Justin's testimony. I think I can. Little train, I think I can, I think I can. Justin is in Winnipeg, Canada. I was in... Uh, I'm trying to remember. Rugby. I knew it was something that won football. So much rugby, North Dakota, which is the center point of North America. And I was up there with a lady named Bart Becker. You guys probably know Bart. Great lady. And let me see if I went past this. Well, I like you there. And um, this guy named Justin shows up in this meeting from Winnipeg, Canada. He's driven five hours, <coughs> he and a friend, to come hear me because he had heard me teach on the courts of heaven on YouTube. So he drove for five hours to get there. Because this is his testimony. <coughs> I didn't understand it. I didn't know what to do. I listened to you. I knew there was something to it. I did what you said to do, and I had amazing results. So he wanted, I was that close. He wanted to come hear me. So he and his friend Jeff drove there, listened to me, and they drove seven hours back in a snowstorm. And then they came to Texas when we had a little seer training, uh, which we'll be doing in the conference as well. And... Um, you know, just, just invested lots of time. But this is just his testimony. He's had a quick testimony. Oh, this is a different testimony. Let me read this one for you. He said, a guy named Peter came to my house three weeks ago. He lost his retirement because of financial advisory, stole their money, and ripped a bunch of people off. He lost his house, etc. He was a retired pilot. As a result, he was forced to work again. We took this into the courts and dealt with the legal stuff. His request to the father was that he would not have to work as much and would receive way more money to recover what he needed. The next week he got called into the office. He thought he was getting laid off. The boss said, you're not in trouble. Relax. He said, we were hiring a guy to operate the commercial division, but we felt last minute that we wanted you to operate it instead. Also, you will only oversee. The others will do all the work, and you will get paid in full for the position. Justin said, just amazing. That's just one testimony. Let me find the other one. Because this is Justin's personal testimony. Hang with me, and I will, I will, be, I will be through. I've had to look for this before. you think I would mark it or something. I'll put it in saved or something or another. Because it is such a powerful testimony. Thank you, Lord. Reformers. Voice of the chords. Belfast. I'm going to Belfast, Northern Ireland. <laughs> Justin. Hi, Robert. It's Justin from Winnipeg, Canada. I wanted to give you a short testimony of how your teaching has impacted my life. I started a street ministry about five years ago. It grew from, from me to over 60 people walking the streets, praying for people, seeing hundreds get saved, healed, and delivered. Then at the four-year mark, Jesus told me to raise up a leader and pass it on. So I did. I also traveled to eight different countries teaching on evangelism and moving, moving in power, etc. Everything got shut down. He said, my ministry shut down. I invested $750,000 in a construction business that was doing awesome. At the same time, every client stopped paying me, so my business got shut down. My whole life was on hold. I couldn't figure out why. When I heard about the courts, I began to engage, but little success because I didn't understand it. Then I found your teaching. Watch what he's about to say. I spent three months. We want to spend three minutes. I spent three months going into the court, cleaning up my life. Three months going into the court, cleaning up my life. I'm assuming that means his own personal life, but his, the iniquity in his bloodline. Then when I was finished, an angel called favor. 
came to me. And since then, all the doors have blown open. My business is booming. I have opened two new businesses since they are booming. And all the doors of ministry are wide open again. Since the court, I have led over 20 people to Jesus just at work. Healing and deliverance are a daily occurrence. Even countries are opening up my, again. My family is exploding with breakthrough. I just want to thank you so much for your faithfulness. You literally have changed our lives through your teaching. How many of you would like an angel called favor? Just yeah. <laughs> show up. He spent three months. This is what I mean when I say we have to do the work in the priesthood and then step into our kingship and make decrees. It is different for everybody. I have seen instantaneous results. I mean, just like that, in moments. But then you have testimonies like this where you spent three months dealing with issues and then an angel called favor shows up. I say, Lord, forgive me for being so impatient. Amen? Amen? So would you stand with me? Thank you, Lord, for your presence. I sense right now. I believe that an angel called favor is available to us. We don't want to be legalistic. We don't want to say, well, we gotta do we gotta do three months. No. We gotta do whatever the Lord says for us to do. But realizing any delay, any delay that we are experiencing can be connected to the fact that there's still something legal resisting us. And that once we get legal things in place from our priesthood, we can step into kingship and make decrees that heaven will back up. Amen? So, Father, we just want to thank you for your understanding. I just want to thank you for loving us so much that you pull back the veil and you cause us to see and perceive the ways of the Spirit. Lord, what's going on in the Spirit? We don't want to be so brash or so arrogant as to say everything's got to fit into this box. We wouldn't say that, Lord. But we would say, Lord, that we want to see your will done in our life. And we want to see your will done in Kansas. And we want to see your will done in America. And we want to see, Lord, all that you have ordained become a reality, Lord Jesus. And we want to be a part of that process on every level, Lord. Lord, that we move into the, the places that you have for us. Lord, I want to thank you for your blood that speaks for us in the courts of heaven. Your blood that is speaking better things than that of Abel. That's what your word says. That you speak better things than that of Abel, O oh God. Just tell him, Lord. Lord, you, your blood speaks. Just tell him, your blood speaks, Lord. Your blood speaks better things than that of Abel. But it's speaking in our behalf. And we're coming into an agreement with that blood. Your blood is not something that has spoken. Lord, your blood is something that is presently speaking, Lord Jesus. Speaking in the courts of heaven. Speaking for us. Remembering us, O oh God. Remembering us, O oh God. And causing, Lord, our situations, our cases, Lord, to come before your courts in remembrance. We thank you for that, Lord Jesus. We thank you for that, Lord. And Lord, we just want to say to you that we want out of delay. Just tell him that. Lord, we want delay to end. We want it to end for ourselves. We want it to end for our family. We want it to end for the body of Christ, Lord. Lord, it is time for the body of Christ to come out of delay so that we can move into everything that you have for us, oh God, and we can see the fullness of that which you have ordained and the fullness of that which you have intended. Lord, be a reality, Lord. Father, not just drops, Lord, Lord, of, of your will being done. Lord, not just dribbles of your will being done, but Lord, literally, Lord, a gushing river, Lord. Lord, flowing, Lord God, out of heaven, oh God, for the will of God to be accomplished, Lord Jesus, even here in Kansas, Lord. 
Lord, I just want to say over Kansas, Lord, we are not content, content with drops of revival, oh God. We want the downpour, oh God. We want the downpour, oh God. We want the downpour, oh God, to come out of the courts of heaven, oh God, and to fall upon this land and upon this people, oh God. Lord, we want the downpour of heaven. Just begin to cry out. Come on, just for a few moments, just say, if you want to do it in your prayer language, whatever. Thank you, Lord. Lord, the outpouring of God, even over Kansas, oh God. Lord, over our lives, but over Kansas, oh God. That the rain of God began to fall, oh God, and saturate this land, oh God. Lord, that all that's been spoken by the prophets, all that has been promised, all that has been said, oh God, all the iniquitous thrones, Lord, pulled down and destroyed, oh God. We say everything resisting your will, removed, oh God. Lord, in agreement with the word of God, oh Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, in an outpouring from heaven, Lord, that nothing can resist, O oh God. Lord, I'm reminded of David that said, you have broken through my enemies like a breakthrough of water. We pray for that even over Kansas, oh God. But greater and greater rounds of breakthrough, oh God. Father, even in this land that you have, that you have claimed for yourself, Lord, I even say that this is the land that you have married, oh God. That you have married, that you have called this land of Beulah, oh God. Lord, the married of the Lord, oh God. The married of the Lord, that which the Lord has chosen. That it is not a place of rejection, but it is a, it is a place of acceptance. Even that which God has chosen, and even that which God has married for himself, Lord. Lord, I thank you for that even over Kansas, Lord. That he belongs to you. It's a, it's, a, it's a state. It's a region that has been dedicated to you. Father, now we say that even as revivals have sprung here in times gone by, that they spring here again in greater and greater realms of glory, O oh God. In greater and greater realms of glory, O oh God. That there should be a manifestation of the glory of God. Of the glory of God. Of the glory of God. And Lord, that which others have rejected, Lord, you accept. You accept, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I, Lord, Lord, I see Kansas standing up as a mighty, mighty man, oh God. Standing up. It's almost like I see something st like, like Kansas standing up and shaking itself free from the dust of the earth. I say Kansas shakes free from all the witchcraft, from all the witchcraft that has tried to hold it down. And Kansas is standing up in its right position, in its right place, oh God. It is standing up, oh God. I see it's like a, it's like a great warrior standing up and shaking free even from all of that that has tried to contain it, that's tried to resist it, that's tried to hold it down, I say, Kansas, stand up, stand up, and take your place, and take your position, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, oh God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The net that has been bent down, I say it straightens. It straightens, it straightens, it straightens, it straightens. Ila kadala basheli akoto. Ila mama soto. Ila mama sikala bayata.
you that are pregnant, put your hand on your belly and say, no more delay. Say to your womb, no more delay. No more delay. Lord, I say everything that is resisting the, the, the delivering, the deliverance, Lord. Yeah. Father, from that which we have been pregnant with, we say, no more delay. No more delay. Lord, we say any legal thing the accuser is using. We say to you, the blood of Jesus answers that. And we say, no more delay. We say we will bring forth fully and completely, oh God. Lord, I even say as you spoke to me in dreams, oh God, and showed me what it was. It was causing the delay. Lord, so I say, speak in dreams. Speak in visions, Lord, to your people, oh God. Anything specific that needs to be heard or seen or understood, even this day and even in days to come, Lord, so that they can deal with it, move it out of the way, and there shall be no more delay. No more delay. I thank you for doing this, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that this shall be done and this shall be accomplished, Lord. Thank you for it, Lord, and that we bring forth fully that which we have carried, Lord, from you and been impregnated with by you. Thank you for this, Lord, a full delivery. A full delivery, Lord Jesus. A full delivery. A full delivery. A full delivery, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for it. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Every frustration broken. Every misery removed. Every destruction caused by the delay reversed. And restoration coming. I thank you for doing it, Lord, to your glory and to your honor. Thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you just give the Lord a big praise?